um, talks about our research, events, education. Um, please feel free to sign up. I'm just going to pass it around during the talk. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, as Katie said, I'm Emily. I am a PhD student at UCLA. And today I will be talking to you a little bit about uh, how I became where I, or how I came to where I am now. Um, and then also a little bit about some of the research that I've been conducting out here on Catalina this summer um, and previous summers. And so, yeah, the title of my talk is Assessing Mechanisms Facilitating Success in the Invasive Alga Sargassum Hole. So a little bit about me. I grew up in Michigan, uh, specifically the Ann Arbor region, if anybody is familiar. And I spent a lot of my childhood in and around the Great Lakes region um, and other freshwater lakes um, in Michigan, as well as vacationing to the coast of North Carolina and Florida. And growing up, I um, kind of developed a deep appreciation for these ecosystems. And some of my favorite activities were uh, boogie boarding, <laughs> surfing, and playing on the beach uh, with my sister, who's over there. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, growing up, I really developed a deep appreciation for these ecosystems and um, really start, like, really loved spending all the time I could in the water um, and so on. But as I started to grow older, I started noticing some distinct changes happening in these ecosystems that I love so much. The first of which was the invasion of zebra mussels. So zebra mussels um, are native to um, Ukraine and Russia, and they invaded the Great Lakes region in the 1980s. Um, but really started to prol proliferate in the areas that I was familiar with um, during my childhood. And the second thing I noticed was the invasion of uh, Eurasian milfoil, which is a freshwater alga uh, that's native to Asia, Europe, and North Africa. And um, it really started to proliferate in the 2000s. Um, and so I noticed how these invasive species were really kind of impacting these ecosystems that I love so much. And I became concerned as to, I guess, why these changes were happening, but also how they could be fixed. So this was kind of my first step towards conservation biology um, and conservation specifically of these aquatic ecosystems. So growing up, I, again, was really familiar with the freshwater ecosystems, but I had a long-standing interest in the ocean because it was kind of foreign and mysterious and so on. And I became interested um, in kind of learning more about it. So I participated in this program called Odyssey Expeditions, which um, leads high school to middle age middle school age students on these sailing trips throughout the Caribbean. Um, and so I participated this, in this when I think I was in middle school. Um, and uh, during these trips, you not only learn how to sail, um, but you also get an extensive introduction to the ocean um, and the organisms living in the ocean and also conservation issues related to the ocean. So um, we got to participate in, or we got to visit some sea turtle rehabilitation centers and learn about how plastic pollution was really impacting sea turtle populations and also light pollution, how that was in, uh, impacting sea turtle populations. Um, and then we also learned how overfishing was impacting the reefs out there. Um, and I also uh, got my scuba cert got some scuba certifications through this program. So I got my open water and advanced certifications and then numerous other specialties. Uh, so after participating in this program for two summers, I was pretty convinced that marine biology and specifically conservation marine biology was something that I wanted to pursue as a future career. So then I started my undergrad at UC Santa Cruz pursuing a BS in marine biology. And yeah, go Stellars. <laughs> <laughs> and during my time at UC Santa Cruz, I not only expanded my knowledge of the ocean, but also kind of refined it specifically with uh, into like California ecosystems, uh, marine ecosystems. And I took classes like kelp forest ecology, where I developed uh, research projects specifically related to kelp forests in the Monterey Bay. I got my scientific diving certification where this allowed me to actually conduct underwater research. And then I took other classes like invertebrate zoology and marine botany, which kind of further expanded my knowledge of um, the natural history of the ocean and then also California um, organisms. Um, and in addition to all of these classes, I also participated in several research projects during my undergrad. The most prominent of these was um, helping researchers with the um, that were part of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, looking at methods for enhancing abalone recruitment um, in along the California coast and up the West Coast. Um, so abalone are a type of marine mollusk that are um, actually pretty threatened in California. They are heavily fished and have a variety of other impacts that are really um, kind of damaging their populations. So we were looking at methods of enhancing the recruitment in the wild. Um, 
and so on. So this is this is a really kind of a uh, fun project to be a part of. After I graduated UC Santa Cruz, I kind of continued some of this research that I had been conducting in undergrad. Um, and I went up to the University of Washington, specifically Friday Harbor, um, to help these the same researchers with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, looking at how the pinto abalone populations in the San Juan Islands um, may be um, enhanced based on the methods we were looking at. Um, and then I worked at a research station in Chilean Patagonia for a little bit after I graduated. And during my time down there, I really was helping out with um, investigations looking at the benthic ecology of the Patagonian fjords down there, which are actually pretty understudied. And this was really, really cool experience to be a part of. And then I got a job with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, uh, working with their ground fish ecosystem management project. Um, so ground fish are kind of a species complex and they incorporate or they encompass a variety of recreationally recreationally fish species and my job um, in this role was really kind of helping with the outreach um, and so I spent a lot of time uh, in and around like the fishing um, piers and the harbors uh, kind of talking to fish uh, fishermen directly and making sure they understood the regulations and how to identify a threatened, uh, threatened and fish uh, species. So after I took a year off on undergrad, I uh, kind of missed learning, uh, and so I decided to take my uh, education a step further, and was fortunate enough to get into a PhD program at UCLA. And kind of thinking about what I wanted to do um, for my dissertation research, I kept thinking about kind of what impacted me growing up, what I really was passionate about growing up, and I kept coming back to these species invasions in the Great Lakes region, and I became interested in what kind of species invasions um, maybe were impacting the ecosystems around UCLA um, and Southern California. And that's where I came across Sargassum Corneri, which is what I'm studying currently. But before I get into the great details about my research, um, I wanted to kind of give a little bit more background into um, invasive species. So what are invasive species? While many species may travel from their native range to a non-native location, species that have really no discernible impact on the environments they invade are considered to be introduced species. On the other hand, species that have a negative impact on the environments they invade are considered to be invasive species. Successful species invasions can often lead to the loss of ecosystem services, such as recreation, tourism, food, etc. And because of this, they can often lead to a severe economic loss. They can also lead to reduced ecosystem complexity, habitat loss, and because of this, species invasions are one of the leading um, reasons for severe declines in biodiversity. So transitioning to Sargassum corneri, which is my study species, it's a brown marine alga in the class Theophyceae. It exhibits a rapid growth rate, mm -hmm. a high fecundity, so it's capable of producing many little Sargassum babies at once. <laughs> and high temperature tolerance. Um, and so this, these three traits are um, kind of um, <coughs> hypothesized to be kind of facilitating its rapid spread and um, proliferation in Southern California currently. Um, it can grow up to three meters in length, so it can get pretty tall. It has these air bladders, which buoy the thallus up to the surface so it can get more light. Um, and then also, if it becomes attached, it allows it to kind of float long distances and spread that way. So if anybody's familiar with the pelagic sargassum blooms in Florida and the Caribbean currently, um, those are basically being able, they float on the surface because of these air bladders. Um, and then sargassum horneri has an annual life history. So is that, has anybody ever seen sargassum horneri, at least like around Catalina? Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but currently, it's in its small, um, like they call it the recruit stage, so it's like the smallest life stage. But if you come back to the same location in the wintertime, it will be in its adult stage, which is like, it can be like nine feet in height, so like super, super big. And so this is like the annual life history, and then it all dies off in the spring, and then continues the same cycle over and over again. Um, so it may not seem like there's a lot of it now, but if you come back in the winter, it's very prevalent. Is there any way to get rid of it? Well, that's kind of like where I'm going, um, but it's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty widespread right now, um, but I'll talk about it. So Sargassum Horneri is native to South Korea, South Korea and Japan, and it arrived in Long Beach Harbor in 2003. Since its arrival, it has spread 
um, throughout Southern California. So these left panels are Southern California. And you can see that it spread throughout the Channel Islands from 2003 to 2015. And then north towards Point Conception. And these are the dots represent Sargassum Horror and Bated Sites. And then it's also spread south into Baja, California. And you can see how it's expanded since then. And these, this only goes until 2015, but it has since expanded since then. Um, so despite its widespread range currently and its seemingly rapid proliferation, little is really known as to why Sargassum Horner is so successful in Southern California, as well as uh, whether certain communities are more or less susceptible to invasion, which is particularly critical because recent attempts at eradication have actually proven unsuccessful in sites that where Sargassum Horner has already been established. So um, identifying these vulnerable sites may kind of inform management and kind of inform more efficient and successful management which is where my research comes in. Um, so I'm interested in what mechanisms really facilitate the success of Sargassum Horner Eye in Southern California. So there actually has been one previous study looking into these, same, these similar questions. Um, and this was done by researchers up at UC Santa Barbara. And they were looking at these long-term community monitoring data sets. Um, one of them was PISCO, um, and then the other one was a data set from the National Park Service. Um, so these guys actually go out to the same sites year after year and, um, and collect the same measurements. So they have kind of these like, uh, like algal abundance metrics, they have invertebrate metrics, they have um, data on, um, I guess, like fish abundances and how that changes through time. So um, these researchers took this data and looked at whether certain communities were more or less susceptible to invasion by Sargassum horneri. And what they found was that the most resistant communities were those that had a high native algal diversity and abundance. So algae, they all required, they all had the same resource requirements, which are nutrients, light, and then space. Um, and so they found that these areas that have high native algal abundance were actually um, uh, resistant to invasion by Sargassum horneri, and it was predicted that these native al algae were outcompeting Sargassum horneri and preventing it from establishing there. They also found that sites that were dominated by sea urchins were also resistant to invasion because these sea urchins were so dense that they were eating all the algae in sight, including Sargassum horneri, and that herbivory was a mechanism that was inhibiting Sargassum horneri from establishing there. Oh, they also found that the most vulnerable communities were those that had either intermediate algal diversity and abundance or varying urchin density. So neither competition or herbivory was really able to prevent Sargassum horneri from establishing there. So as I mentioned, the, these conclusions were only based from long-term data. And so there actually haven't been any empirical tests in the field of these conclusions. Um, and these conclusions are only for Anacapa Island in the Northern Channel Islands. So my research specifically seeks to address whether competition or herbivory can determine Sargassum Horneri success on Catalina Island and kind of the Southern Channel Islands, which are very different than in the Northern Channel Islands. So to do this, um, I first chose a site, and um, I currently my site is at Isthmus Point, if anybody's familiar, which is um, directly across from two, um, we're kind of where we are right now, which is the Red Star, um, and so it's on like the west side of two harbors, and this site is pretty cool because um, it actually has these discrete patches that are really high in um, algal abundance and density, um, in low in urchin abundance, and then they also have patch. It also has patches that are high in urchins and low in algal abundance. So this is perfect for me to test these questions. Um, but before I kind of went into it, I um, wanted to quantify, I guess, like how much algae was actually there, how much, how many urchins were actually there. So to quantify algae, I did some quadrat surveys, um, and then to quantify urchins, I did some invertebrate swaths, which is a survey method. And measured, I also measured the size of these urchins. And so I ended up choosing four sites, two of which, which are the yellow bars, are my algal dominated sites. And you can see this is um, looking at the native algal percent covered by these sites. And you can see my two um, algal sites are very high in algal percent cover, whereas my two urchin sites, which are um, denoted by the purple, are very low in native algal percent cover. And these sites that are dominated by native algae are dominated by this low lying um, algae in the order dic called Dictyotales. Um, these are some examples here. And so these are able to actually like directly compete with Sargassum horneri. And then for my urchin-dominated sites, you can see that 
my algal dominated sites still have some urchins, but they're not quite as abundant um, in those sites as they are in my urchins. So um, those kind of these are the sites that I end up using and were um, ideal for testing my question. So once I had these sites chosen, um, I did some, I ran some growth experiments where I chose, or I collected a bunch of recruit sargassum corneri, which is again like the smallest stage. And these, this is the first stage to probably occupy open space if it becomes available in the first in the line of succession or uh, invasion. So um, this is kind of like the most vulnerable stage, but if it's successful, the uh, invasion will proliferate. And so I collected a bunch of sargassum, uh, recruit sargassum corneri. And I spun everything in a low-velocity centrifuge, otherwise known as your household salad center. <laughs> um, and this basically standardized the amount of water on all of the thalli and allowed me to get an accurate and reproducible estimate of how much each thallus weighed. Um, once I did that, I attached everything to lines and um, put them all in cages, or put half of them in cages at each site. And these cages, are especially designed to prevent urchin herbivory, but allow other types of herbivory to occur. So as urchins try and crawl up the sides of these cages, they reach these lips and fall off. But the top is completely open, so other like fish or anything else can get in there and um, eat the algae if they want. Um, they're also completely open on the bottom, save for a small strip of cage, um, to which like, I attach the sargassum corneri to. And this allowed other types of algae to come through the bottom and interact with sargassum corneri. <laughs> Um, while still preventing urchin and berry. So the idea is, um, is that, um, I guess, after, after I kind of uh, put all this out into the field for two weeks or so, I pulled it out and um, measured the percent change in growth, or the percent change in weight and the relative growth over that time period. And the idea is the algae, or the sites where sargassum hornari grew the least, are the sites that are probably most resistant to invasion, and the sites where sargassum hornari uh, grew the most are the sites that are most and I can compare between the caged and the uncaged to really uh, measure the strength of herbivory at those sites, or urchin herbivory specifically. And I also measured the temperature, or I kept track of the temperature and light at these sites. And here are some uh, pictures of my uh, replicates, or my experimental units. The right are the uncaged replicates, and then the left you can see my cages, and a good photobomb by Garibaldi. <laughs> <laughs> And unfortunately, I just pulled this experiment out on Wednesday and have not had time to actually analyze this data. So the results are to be determined. But just eyeballing the data, it looks like the algal dominated sites are actually more resistant to invasion by sargassum horai than the urchins. So either the urchins are not as dense as they are in northern Northern Channel Islands and can't really control sargassum horai as well, but it looks like native algae is something that we need to um, kind of preserve. But yeah, if anybody's interested, check back later because that's just me eyeballing it. Um, so even though I don't really have any results yet, um, some implications of this research, as I mentioned, is that because sargassum coronary is so widespread and established at many sites, widespread eradication is probably unlikely at this point and very expensive. So uh, we need to prioritize identifying these vulnerable communities. And once we identify these vulnerable communities, we can focus management efforts on these vulnerable communities. So these vulnerable communities are those that um, maybe will be the next um, to be invaded by sargassum corneri. And um, if we kind of monitor these areas, we can remove, uh, look for new arrivals and remove those new arrivals before it becomes new established in those communities. So pretty much just preventing further spread of this invasive. And then also understanding sargassum corneri's invasion mechanisms will enhance its predictability um, in the future, or enhance the invasion predictability in the future. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, my PhD advisor, Peggy Fong, um, a variety of dive support, and then um, a variety of funding sources, particularly the Wrigley Institute for um, awarding me the graduate fellowship for two summers and um, providing a whole bunch of support that has really been invaluable um, to this research. And with that, I'll take any questions. What makes the uh, sargassum so invasive? I mean, what, what harm do they call, cause if you did nothing? So there are, um, there's only one published paper currently as to its impacts, but um, it was comparing how um, calico bats recruits differently to like kelp versus sargassum, and they found that 
it does not recruit um, as well to Sargassum as it does to uh, giant kelp. So it's not providing the same habitat services as giant kelp is. Um, another um, aspect of my research currently um, is looking at how Sargassum may be competing with giant kelp. Um, I guess like the younger stages, and so um, I guess it, it was maybe apparent in the time series, but Sargassum horneri really started to proliferate around 2015, where the El Nino, when the El Nino was happening, um, it's hypothesized that all, like a lot of the giant kelp that was here, died off during the El Nino, and then Sargassum horneri kind of like took over that space, um, and so that's a potential impact, but it has not been published yet, and but that's kind of like another aspect of my research, um, yeah. Yes. You, you say this is native of Japan. Mm -hmm. Does Japan have a problem with it? It doesn't actually. They actually well, that, they it's they aquaculture go farm it um, because it provides. They don't. I guess they. Yeah. I don't know if they really have the same type of thing as like kelp as we do, or like the same like three dimensional like habitat forming. Um, so Sargassum Corner actually kind of fills that role, I guess, and that like a lot of the fish are. Um, but a lot of the fish like are kind of adapted to work for living in like Sargassum there and like there are things that eat it So it's, it's kind of like a different system over there and they are not having a problem with it. Yeah uh, Yes in the back um, You talked about the annual growth and mm -hmm. then it dies what why does it is it because of the water temperature that it dies and then regrows or so there, is yeah, there cycle? is some speculation that it's like its life stages are timed with changes in temperature. So once it becomes colder, like during the winter, it starts becoming reproductive, and then once temperatures start warming up, it starts to once it becomes reproductive and kind of, I guess, like I don't know, reproduces, you know, and dies off after that. Um, and so there is um, some idea that it's timed with temperature, um, but there are like other researchers that are currently looking at how the life stages kind of fluctuate throughout the year with temperature, um, which is pretty cool. Yes? Um, for the different, are there any different kinds of the, um, like of the algae that you're talking about? I don't know how to say it. <laughs> sargassum? Yes. Yeah, there's actually, um, there's two species of invasive sargassum here. Um, sargassum hornery is the most recent invasion, um, and there's sargassum muticum, which invaded in the 1980s, um, and that is kind of that low abundance is currently, which is, some people may think, or some people think that that may, what uh, may eventually happen to sargassum hornery, just kind of dies off and just kind of like exists at low abundances, but it's, we're not sure. Um, and then there's actually two species of native species of sargassum here. Um, one of them is sargassum pomeri, which is actually really prevalent. Yeah. I was curious, now that you've almost finished your research here, do you have a, a next um, step that you want to take or that you want to pass it on to other researchers, like what you want them to take? What's the next step for this line of thinking? Um, I think I think it would be interesting, um, at least for um, these questions, to test it in like other sites, you know, and maybe look at, um, because like this Catalina is very different than the Northern Chilean Islands and um, like there are actual urchin barrens that exist up in um, the Northern Chilean Islands, whereas on Catalina it's more so like patches of urchins are pretty dense, but it's not like they're decimating entire like, like spaces, you know, so maybe testing it in the field with, I guess like up in the Northern Chilean Islands to see like if it actually up like is um, upheld in the field, you know, um, and I think that the researchers that did the um, the study with the long-term data may be looking at that too. So, yep. Yes. Is there any way to destroy them when they're dormant or when they die off? Um, in, there there could be, but they at that point they've already kind of like emitted all of their reproductive structures, oh, and they're already sense. like yeah. Um, kind of like they're almost like they're microscopic. You like can't really see it, you know. So unfortunately, it's. Um, I think like the yeah, it's it's hard. It would be hard. Yeah. So what was El Nino? Oh, El Nino is a climatic warming event um, that happens um, kind of. It's kind of like sporadic, but um, the last well, there's some people think that we had the last year because the water's really warm and basically it results in warmer than um, average water temperatures. And so a lot of um, a lot of things don't really like it. And you know, sometimes you'll get like things coming up from Baja uh, that follow the warm water. Um, so 
Um, last summer, we there was like some tropical species of fish in uh, Big Fisherman's Cove, um, and I think we uh, somebody saw one this summer too. So it, they, it's like a it's a weird warming event um, that causes warmer than average temperatures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the back. I'm not sure how I'm sure you said it, but what's bad about this? What's bad about what? About this invasion, invasive species taking over. What's the long-term detrimental effect? Well, worry about it. yeah, because because it proliferated so recently, um, there's still like a lot of research being done into its actual impacts, but um, it is occupying a lot more space than um, all. It's like the dominant, um, I guess, like space holder currently, um, at least like in the winter time when it's really big. And so um, it's probably out competing a lot of the native algae. And um, like I said, like I'm looking at how it's impacting uh, macrocystis, the giant kelp, um, which is very important for the coast. Um, and then um, there's some other researchers that are looking at, um, I guess, how it's maybe providing like um, higher trophic support to like fishes that are like eating off it and so on. Um, and so right now there isn't any, there's only one published study looking at the impacts of sargassum. Um, but there's a lot of current research that just hasn't really been published and um, kind of really kind of concluding that it isn't really providing the same type of support as native algae. Yeah. Yes? Um, in the vulnerable communities, what you talked about, is there a way to support or enhance or protect the native algae? Yeah, I think that, I think there probably will be, like there is, you know, um, and I think that um, but it may be like pretty complex, and I I don't really quite know like the methods that would like go into that. But um, yeah, I know that like some people are like trying to restore kelp beds and so on, and um, that would be that would be like a good thing to look at. I think. Yeah. Yes. It's like you were saying, it wipes out the giant kelp, which is where when you're diving usually it makes like forests and there's all kinds of fish and right. things around it. Right. Is there any giant kelp that's still around in this area? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Where, where from? Right from here. Um, the right around the corner at um, like the intake pipes. Like if you go around, cove around, right? The yeah, if you go around the right corner, um, there's a kelp forest there. Um, there was a kelp forest kind of by the chalk cliffs um, to the left, mm -hmm. outside the left of the cove. Um, but it seems like that might be dying back a little bit. Um, there is also one kind of on the um, northern end of Bird Rock, um, just outside the EPA. Um, so, yeah. Yes. What sort of depth is it? So, it's the stuff, the work that I'm doing is around like 20, um, 25 to 30 feet. Um, and I think, I'm not sure it's like lower depth range. Um, but kind of like that area seems to be a sweet spot for it. And shall, like a shower probably, I mean, I think you can grow like all the way up into the inner tidal, but I think it's probably um, like five feet or deeper um, is probably its optimal range. Yeah. Yeah. In regards to that question, because of the thermal climb, water temperature has a big difference in that. Thing. Totally. Right. Yeah, so they, yeah, there's one, um, or one hypothesis is that with El Nino, Sargassum Horneri actually, like, did better, or at least it did better than, like, giant kelp, you know, and it kind of, like, took off, but it's unknown as to whether it even, if it grows better with warmer temperature, or if it grows faster. So my lab mate, Lauren, is actually looking at how its growth rate differs with different temperatures. So, yeah. Have they looked at the growth rates? Northern invasive, southern invasive they have not. to see if you know you're finding any high growth areas. Yeah, they have not, but that'd be really interesting to look at. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, it just attaches to rocks, or how does it yep. attach to the rocks? Or? Yep. Yeah, okay. and uh, yeah, it usually will attach to rocks, but I've actually been finding it attached to other algae uh, really? recently. Oh. Yeah, which is kind of weird. And so I think maybe like it's like, so like. It's just trying to find like some some space to attach to so and it definitely needs light. Yep, definitely. Yep. Okay. But it's not a parasite. It's not a parasite. No, it just is like yeah, attaching to whatever I can. It's like a weed. It is a weed, yeah. A double weed, that's what they call it. Yeah. Yeah. So how long will your research continue? Because it sounds like from the eighties and the two thousands, they had a lot of years to look at the impact and yeah. How long will will you be able to continue the research? Or so this 
like this actually is kind of like wrapping up for me. Um, but yeah, what I, I guess I, what I end up doing um, after this um, is up for up for debate. Um, but um, I think that like it would be interesting to kind of see how it progresses um, throughout. Like I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cool to get like a long term like monitoring to see how it like changes through time and whether it actually does start to die off eventually. But um, yeah, that's not currently the scope of what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So you just said that they, it attaches to algae as well. It, it, per, but, well. it usually will attach, like most of the time will attach to rock. And I've, in rare instances, I've been seeing it attached. Okay, because I was wondering, because one of your theories, your postulates, is that in areas that are dense with algae, you, well, you won't right. see abundance of this. So it's just interesting if it's attaching. Are they different species of algae, or is it... So actually, yeah, in I, the only times I've seen it attaching to other algae have been in those like dense algal patches. Um, but it's like it's very rare, and I don't think it's going to be like enough for it to actually like establish there. Um, but it would be it would be interesting, you know. I I've, I've never seen it before, and I don't know if it's just because there's like just not a lot of space in that area because there's so much algae and it's just trying to attach to wherever it can. I was just wondering that if it's just a sorry a follow up that uh -huh. if it's already starting to attach to algae, could it be mutating to where it's acquiring, you know, um, things, you know, characteristics yeah. that would allow it to be resistant to? I don't know. Algae. I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Another study. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all we have left for questions, but thank you so much. Thank you.